Hello, and welcome to the Dad Nobody Wants to Listen to You About New York podcast. This week, I want to talk about one of the most serious problems in New York, and that's the housing crisis. The New York housing crisis is caused by many things, economic, geographical, political, but really the biggest issue right now is that the crisis is worse than it's ever been. And yet, New Yorkers seem to be somewhat ignorant to this. They think, well, in the post-COVID world, shit happens. But to be honest, nothing really is being done about it, despite the fact that there is a new mayor, a democratic ex-policeman, who says that he cares about housing and cares about doing something to increase the supply of affordable housing. It's quite easy to blame greedy landlords, for instance, for the high rents in New York. Equally, you could say that it's just supply and demand. It's well known that there's always been this inverse relationship between the lack of supply and the high price of apartments. It could also be that the policy adopted by countless uh, city governments over the years has made the problem worse rather than better. Well-intentioned ideas of rent control or new legislation to try to protect landlords and tenants has really backfired and it's created the biggest shortage of housing in New York's history. So in this podcast, I want to find out why there are over 50,000 vacant apartments in the city that are not being used. I want to cut through the jargon that's used, such as rent control and rent stabilisation. I want to find out about property taxes. I want to see what effect zoning has had and gentrification in the city. And why, for instance, as recently as 2018, were there 64,000 homeless people living in New York City? This is the highest number since the Great Depression. And this number includes over 15,000 children sleeping rough or in homeless shelters every night. But in order to get into the detail of the housing crisis in New York, I need to talk to you a little bit about the history of property in New York City, as it's really something that's created the housing crisis ever since the founding of New York. I won't bore you too much about the history of New York City, but it is interesting to see how it all started. Back in 1624, when the first colonists came to what was called New Holland from Amsterdam, a small colony of people created farmhouses and little livestock places in, in order to try to uh, cash in on the boom that was the fur trade at the time. A few years later, in 1626, the very first slaves started being imported from Africa, from Angola, in fact. And very, very soon, uh, New Amsterdam, which would soon become uh, New York under the English when they took over from the Dutch, became one of the most important slaving centers and midway pass-through places for the slave trade to Europe. But New York became such an important place that it started growing very, very quickly to thousands of people. And the actual land that was available to build on was not very great. Most of Manhattan at the time was occupied by Indians, and the earlier settlers kept themselves way down in the south of New York and really never got much further than what is now called Wall Street. And that's because Stuyvesant, who was one of the early governors, he built it into the town that it became and made lots of road houses and crammed people into very, very tight spaces and eventually built a 2,340-foot wall that went from the west side to the east side. That currently is left over as Wall Street, mainly on the east side. So many thousands of people were crammed into a very small slice of land. So the people obviously became experts at how to live in a small community, and they ended up living tooth by jowl right next to each other with their animals, and things were very, very tight. For a long time, there was no building in the north part of the wall because of the Indians, and they wanted to keep the English out. But eventually, as history has shown us, uh, 
things began to expand and New York grew and grew. And really the first major crisis happened in the 1920s, sort of after the First World War. And in the 1930s, the first serious effort was made to try to alleviate the housing shortage. So many people were wanting to move to New York and there was nowhere for them to live. So in the 30s, over 700,000 units were built for people. So really, all the way up to the present day, there's always been a shortage of space because New York City is an island. And there's always been a shortage of housing as well due to the influx of people that have moved into the town and there's just not enough places for them to live. During the uh, COVID pandemic uh, and immediately after, it was much clearer to people that rents weren't as bad as they were, but they were still pretty high. But obviously since the pandemic has ended, things have really begun to climb. The median rent, I think, in April 2020 was about $3,650 for an apartment. And this has been climbing to about 4000 a month in 2022. And right now in New York, the median rent is hovering around $5,000 a month, which is the first time in, in the borough's history. The other boroughs of New York haven't really fared very well either. If you think about Brooklyn, which has become a sort of a gentrified place where people who can't afford to live in Manhattan have moved to, rents have increased anything from a medium of 3,000 in places like Queens to over 4,000 in places like Brooklyn, places you probably wouldn't expect to be paying such high rents. And with extraordinary high rents, you have extraordinary scenes. And it's well known that you can see dozens of people sometimes lining up to take a tour for some small or costly apartment that's come onto the market. And there's so much overcrowding in New York. There's nearly 10% of households in New York that have one person per room. It's probably much higher. You have immigrants who live in these neighborhoods hiding basically in basements, going unrecorded. Roommates, you can't afford to live in Manhattan almost unless you have a roommate maybe three roommates in a one-bedroom apartment. But, you know, it's not just the shortage of housing or the shortage of affordable housing. There is this desperate need for people to find somewhere to live because New York is such an attractive place to live. This is caused skyrocketing rents. There's a wonderful word that's used within all the rental legislation, and it's called what the market will bear. Well, if you don't live in what's called a rent controlled or rent stabilized apartment, you're really at the mercy of what the market will bear, which will be anything that a landlord decides he wants to ask for his apartment. That's not unique to New York City, but what has gone crazy is the whole system of rent control and rent stabilization that was originally designed to keep tenants protected from landlords raising rents uncontrolled. So I wanted to find out what does rent control mean? Rent control is an old system for buildings that were built in New York before 1947. And this was really due to the shortage of housing after World War II. You might wonder, well, why would there be a shortage of housing after World War II? That's mainly because when a lot of the veterans came back, the New York government wanted to help people and thank them for all their service to the country. And they wanted to try and create places for them to live and work and communities where they would feel safe and perhaps to a certain extent try to forget about the atrocities that they'd witnessed. So nowadays, if you can get hold of a rent-controlled apartment, that means that these apartments' rents are very, very protected. As long as you've lived in that apartment continuously since 1971, you're effectively, even in 2023, almost paying 1970s rents. The median rent in a rent-controlled apartment is only about 1000 a month. But these rent-controlled apartments are rapidly disappearing. They only stay rent controlled as long as the tenants stay there. And there are provisions that allow them to pass them on to their relatives when they die. 
But as I found out, of course, quite a few people try to pretend they're relatives in order to get the apartments. But that being said, there are very few rent-controlled apartments left in New York. Another system was created for all buildings that were constructed after 1947, um, but before 1974, and these are called rent-stabilized apartments. Now, these apartments have to conform to certain standards in order to be able to get tax breaks. Briefly, there are two or three quite important classifications of property taxes. There are taxes which are called the J51 taxes. They're applied to a building that has been rehabited or converted from another use. There are the 421A and 421 B tax benefits, and these are exemptions that are given to people who own developments of houses that have families that have affordable housing. And it has to be something that shows that they're improving the housing stock for everybody. And these tax breaks are usually available for 15 to 20 years after the completion of the project. It was originally called Affordable New York. It was a way of trying to encourage developers to make apartments that were affordable for people to live in. So right now in New York, there are about 16, 17,000 rent controls left, and there are about a million rent stabilized apartments left. Now I can hear you saying, well, that's pretty good, over a million. Yes, but in a city that I think between 2008 and 2018, have added 675,000 new jobs, you can see very quickly any new apartments, any new developments are going to be filled very, very quickly. This is definitely underlined by the statistic that in 2010 to 20, that decade, the city only added about 200,000 units of housing. So to put that into perspective, there's probably one new apartment for every three people that are moving into the city. It's an unsustainable problem. This troubling trend is really to do with government. They've not been able to do much to improve the flow of housing. They've never really rushed to uh, allow permits to build new apartments. And these tax programs have really done very little in the end to encourage developers to build new apartments. So for many years, the housing situation was controlled largely by the property tax system. The idea was that if you could subsidize property taxes for the landlords, it would encourage developers to build more apartments. But that only worked for a certain amount of time. By 2019, the crisis had developed so badly that a law was passed to try to improve the situation for tenants, and it was called the HSTPA Act of 2019. The idea of this was that it was supposed to protect tenants from eviction, it was supposed to avoid tenant blacklists, and it was also a way to try to control the vacancy rate in New York, increasing the amount of available apartments for rental. But the problem with the HSTPA Act of 2019 is one of its key points was trying to limit the amount that rents could be raised. They have a term called the MCR, which is the maximum collectible rent. And they have another term called the MBR, which is the maximum base rate. A maximum rate is established for all apartments and it's adjusted every two years but it's supposed to reflect the costs of improving apartments for the tenants. But they're only allowed to increase this by 7.5% a year. And then once they've reached the maximum base rate, they're not allowed to increase it anymore. So while it's true that the tenants might benefit from a less than unfair market pressure, the whatever the market can bear rents, um, the landlords, of course, are suffering because they can't get any more rent than a maximum base rate for these apartments. This is a problem if uh, you want to refurbish your building. 
So a lot of these buildings start falling into disrepair. And again, within this act, there are provisions that will limit the amount of tax breaks that a landlord can have or a developer can have if these buildings do not come up to the codes of cleanliness and building required. So very often, if you live in a rent-stabilized apartment, you may have a lot of repairs that need to be done. And it's very, very hard to get the landlords to want to invest in the apartment. What, one of the biggest issues is that when people leave a rent-stabilized apartment, uh, it's up to the landlord then to decide what he's going to do. He has the right, if he wants, to stop it being rent-stabilized and open it up to the free market. But those people who are living in rent-stabilized apartments, they need to feel that their apartments are being looked after. And there are an awful lot of stories that are showing that these landlords just are not investing. When a rent-stabilized apartment becomes uh, available due to the expiration of a lease, the landlords can only raise the rents by 5%. Now, this has caused a huge issue with the quality of the supply. If you can only raise the rents by 5%, they're never going to be able to recoup what can sometimes be as much as fifty or $60,000 in order to refurbish and, and make sure that the apartment is looked after. In a big building, there are huge expenses, such as lifts, roofs, boilers. And with only a small increase in rents, landlords just have no choice. It's an economic necessity to make a profit. They've got to at least break even. But if they have to refurbish all this stuff with only a 5% increase in rents to pay for it, it's just not going to happen. And in some cases, they're now preferring to keep the apartments vacant. Property tax is one of the most important revenue raising schemes in New York. It represents nearly 45% of all the city's tax dollars collected in 23. And of that, 27% of it is spent on things like the police, the fire, the sanitation, 26% is spent on education, 20% is spent on health and welfare, and 27% or so is spent on transport, housing and parks. Property taxes are certainly worth examining because they are one of the features that cause a lot of the housing shortage and problems in New York. There are two main classes that we should talk about, class one and class two. Class two are for single family homes, uh, maybe one, two or three family homes. And class one are designed for condominiums and co-ops with lots of apartments. But the difference in the tax rates are enormous, with class one being at 20% and class two at about 12.2%. The amount of tax that you pay as a landlord is calculated according to formulas laid down by the, uh, the city tax people. Um, but it's really based on the taxable value of a house. And that's determined by its location and its size and various other factors. So I immediately thought, why is it so much more tax to be paid in a large building with lots of condominiums? It somehow seemed to be a little unfair because the owner has to pay tax on every single apartment in a condominium tower, which may occupy the same sort of land footprint as a, a three-bedroom house or something. So many of the enormous skyscrapers that are built in New York now um, are built on a very small footprint of land, but they go up very, very high and have a lot of apartments. Every square inch of New York City that is not a street is basically zoned. And laws govern exactly how large buildings can be, how they're built, what they're used for, whether they're residential, commercial or manufacturing. But, you know, it's really about how tall a building can be. Now, this is important because the current mayor, Mayor Eric Adams, wants to create more affordable housing. And he's trying to think of initiatives to stimulate this, and he has projects that are working on residential space. But with these buildings that are tall and all being charged at a very high tax rate, there's not a great incentive for owners or developers to develop more properties.
naturally um, owners want to maximize the profits and the and the rents that they can receive in their huge buildings but really these tax calculations don't do an awful lot to help them because although they may get uh, various subsidies as well if they um, maintain affordable housing and do various other things it's been shown that quite often these new buildings do not have any affordable units in them at all. Uh, and more recently, there's even been a slight scandal that one of these tall, tall buildings that has been developed with hundreds of most beautiful apartments, they don't have any r affordable apartments at all. And there was even permission to actually put these affordable apartments in another place, in another part of town. But New York City government has no powers to find out where these so-called ap affordable apartments have actually been built. So if more affordable apartments cannot be built, it's really coming down to the importance of making sure that people can move somewhere else. And of course, that causes gentrification, it's called, because people end up moving to the cheaper suburbs where there is accommodation, and they do the houses up. And in the end, it puts the prices of the houses up and the rents go up and you get the same old problem that you've got in Manhattan. Mayor Eric Adams um, basically made his uh, reputation on trying to do something about increasing the size of the housing base in New York. Uh, he wants to create more affordable housing and he is very critical of young people, mainly white people, he says, moving in from affluent areas of the United States of America in order to come to college or something. And he likens them to pretending that they're almost like Christopher Columbus discovering Brooklyn and New York for the first time. Uh, and he's been quite vocal saying that, you know, New York City belongs to the people and they're the ones who made New York City what it is. And he feels that all these people are moving into these areas in Brooklyn and other parts of uh, rural New York. Uh, that's hijacking the apartments and they're displacing the people who've been living there all along. And of course, um, most of the people who've been living there for a while tend to be the black and Latino community. So you can see that all the legislation that's been passed, even the tax rebates that are given to developers to build um, apartments, haven't really worked because either it's still too expensive to allow people to live in these tall buildings with affordable communities, or it's impossible to raise the rents because of the legislation. This does not give the, the landlords any incentive to refurbish or even have these buildings open on the general market. It can be very, very common that if you're looking for an apartment, you just won't find anything advertised, even though there could be as many as 40 or 50,000 apartments technically vacant. Why is that? because the landlords don't want to advertise them as vacant, because if they do that, then they have all the issues of having to refurbish them. And the sort of proof that these tax incentives really aren't working anymore is that over 2% of uh, apartments are vacant. Um, a lot are owned by foreign owners. You have the so-called pierre de terres. You have certain oligarchs who own buildings, many of these empty. And in fact, only a third of these buildings are claiming any form of tax uh, abatement at all. Many of these buildings have been kept vacant, uh, waiting hopefully for a change in the law. And as recently as last week, there's been a very strong indication that maybe Albany, which is the central capital for uh, of New York government, might repeal this uh, law, the 2019 law, uh, because it's just not working. So if the HSTPA Act is repealed by Albany, the central government, it may well be that more buildings will become available to people to rent because the landlords will have more incentive to do them up. But the problem will be most of them will come with rents that the market can bear, so very high again. There's been a lot of debate about vacant apartments in New York and what can be done. And uh, Vancouver, for instance, in British Columbia, has been trialing a tax on anybody who keeps their house vacant. And they charge as much as 1% of the assessed value of the house, which could be almost two to three times the normal property taxes. And the evidence shows uh, that in British Columbia, the vacancy rate has dropped now to half a percent from about 4%. 
Could this happen in New York? Very probably, but at the moment, although there's a lot of talk, there's not a lot of action on this. Another accusation that's been levelled at the landlords is that they're now creating artificial scarcity so they can ratchet up the market rate for other apartments that they own that are not rent controlled or rent stabilised. And that could be true because if they can make more money from the apartments that are on the open market, then it sort of subsidises their losses by making the other apartments that they have that are rent stabilised, they keep them vacant. And although it sounds very much like the early days of Donald Trump and his father, some landlords are still pretty unscrupulous and uh, they hope that by not refurbishing the apartments and harassing the uh, tenants, that they will leave. And at that point, they can take these apartments from being rent stabilized into being on the open market and what the market will bear. And again, there's a lot of evidence and it's hard to prove, of course, that this illegal harassment is taking place. They really are trying to uh, cause a lot of noise. They renovate in a building and they keep renovating in their building. Never stop renovating, just creating noise, just so the tenants in rent-controlled or rent-stabilized apartments get fed up and move out. The evidence is, is that rent-stabilized apartments are just so valuable, people don't move out. Another problem that's caused shortage of apartments in New York is the boom in building condo projects. Since I think 2018, over 66 condo projects at $100 million or more have been built. But of all these, I've been told only 71% of these buildings are completely sold. I think probably eight have sold out out of more than 70 of these units. On my recent visit to Manhattan, I saw that these towers are everywhere. One 815-unit tower, which is called Extel, on one Manhattan square, is even now only 56% sold. I read an article in the New York Times that claims that one in four of these super luxury condominium apartments are not sold and remain empty. I also visited one of the nicest new developments in Manhattan called the Hudson Yards, where you can walk on the High Line and eventually end up at the Edge, which is a fantastic viewing platform where you can see Manhattan from, I think, about the 100th floor. But this building uh, and the buildings surrounding it are only about 50% sold. Developers are offering discounts of 30 to 50%. And of course, it's not going mainly to Americans. It's going mainly to Asian buyers who are coming up to snap up what they consider to be a deal. And lastly, something that I experienced firsthand that is really causing a, prop a problem with uh, availability in the property market in Brooklyn and New York. And that's the rise of people renting out their apartments privately. This happens in every city in the world virtually, but in New York, it, with a serious housing crisis, it's made things so much worse. The big uh, use of a Airbnb, for instance, uh, has caused a massive amount of apartments to not be listed as available for rent because the landlords would rather have people coming in for short periods. I was told that that wasn't allowed, that the city government said that no Airbnb is allowed to be rented less than 30 days. But in reality, that was never enforced. And as recently as July when I was there, you could search on Airbnb and find hundreds of Airbnb apartments in Manhattan and Brooklyn that would be rentable for a day or two days or three days. So the other way people are doing it is through Facebook. And in fact, when I was there, um, I found through a friend an apartment that was to be sublet for three weeks for me. And no questions asked, basically. You just go there, get the keys, um, and it's all under the radar. There's no taxes to be paid. And of course, the owners of the apartment don't have to conform to any codes, any building codes of safety. There are only a few codes that a, a landlord has to conform to, such as making sure you have fire doors and you have security. Um, you don't actually even have to have fire extinguishers in rental apartments, believe it or not, in Manhattan. But when I was there, of course, um, I found that this apartment did not have a, 
a carbon monoxide detector. It certainly didn't have two means of escape. It certainly didn't have fire doors. And the security of the doors wasn't particularly great. But, you know, that's the normal thing. Um, and if you can, as a person who owns an apartment, or if you're living in an apartment, you can sublet it for a lot of money. And I paid $2,500 for three weeks in uh, an area called Bushwick, which is not the most salubrious area of town. It's no reason that people would want to put their apartments on the uh, open market, have to bring those apartments up to a high standard of repair, pay taxes and be registered. Again, interestingly enough, it was only last week, and we're talking here the 28th of August, that uh, finally Airbnb did actually lose its, uh, its case against the New York government. And as it's lost, it now has to enforce the rule that no apartments are allowed to be advertised on Airbnb for rental less than 30 days. Now, to me, that sounds like a really, really good idea because it's going to hopefully encourage landlords to use those apartments for people who live and work all the time in New York. The second piece of, of probably good news is that the legislation that was passed in 2019 that's causing so many problems for landlords, the HSTPA Act, might well get repealed. Now, yes, okay, it offered protections to tenants, but it's stifling the amount of apartments that are available for rent because landlords are withholding them because they can't afford to renovate them and they don't want to put people into these apartments while there's a chance that this act might actually be repealed. So in conclusion, what can be done to improve the worst housing crisis that New York has ever seen? I think something can be done about vacancies. A tax probably should be considered so people just don't keep their apartments vacant. The property tax system needs to be looked at because at the moment it's not working and it's not encouraging uh, developers to open apartments for um, people who need them urgently. The amount of affordable housing needs to be massively increased. Although recently um, there was a huge amount of fanfare about a massive development, a really old development called the Stuy Town. This is um, an area that was built probably after the war to help house people coming back from the war. These huge, great big brown stone buildings, multi-floor multi buildings, can be seen very easily from Greenpoint in Brooklyn, and they're along the east side of Manhattan. Um, they were recently sold, I think, to Blackstone and various other massive corporations. And they're not really being turned into affordable housing, even though the government is saying they are. You can see the adverts, and mainly they're trying to sell them to very affluent middle-class families. Um, this this Stuyvesant town or Stuy town is, is an example of where the, the New York City government is trying to get affordable housing for its people. But as usual, there seems to be a terrible conflict between building in Manhattan or building in any other suburb and actually not putting off landlords so that they can actually make huge profits. So in the end, something has to be done. New York is not expensive because there's a bubble or because of greedy landlords. It's really because of a competitive market. It's expensive because in a competitive market, prices respond to a disequilibrium between supply and demand. So it's really no point blaming landlords or developers for building towers. They're all playing within the rules. The simple solution is to build more housing, to look at the zoning codes and all the other building regulations and the tax system. Unfortunately, what's happening is public policy has gotten us into this mess and it's making things worse. Uh, there's a vast scale of incompetency on behalf of city governments over the years. There's always a lot of talk and very little action. Talk of housing inequality. But what's happening is I'm seeing more and more is that instead of being able to live where you want to live, you're having to move further and further away from Manhattan. People in Brooklyn are now being taken over by this gentrification. And I want to talk about gentrification and what's happening particularly in areas like Bushwick, where I was staying. So in my next episode, I'm going to take that up as my central theme.